and say a statement. I just want you to yourself to think about if you have ever said this or have ever had this said to you. Uh, and that statement is that that group of people is too weird. Or I don't want them hanging out with me. I don't want to hang out with them. Now, you, maybe you have said that to somebody, or maybe that's been said to you. And what that stems from is, is we as people often categorize people, and we label people, and we put people <coughs> in different groups. And we each have our own groups that we're a part of, and we don't want other people to be a part of our groups. Maybe they're weird. Maybe you think that they're weird. Maybe they have different interests than you. Maybe you don't get along with that person. Maybe it's not that you just don't want them in your group. Maybe it's that you don't even like them. You want them as far away from you as possible. But what happens when we have that mindset is that we miss out on an opportunity to, to share Jesus' love with people. Jesus told us to love others. That was the one thing he told us to do. And when we judge people and label people and write people off, we completely miss out on an opportunity to do that. Because if you don't love somebody and you don't treat someone kindly, they don't want to hear what you have to say. That's the truth of it. And so you really miss out on an opportunity to share the incredible love of Christ with people. Um, every, everywhere you look, uh, there are these groups that we're talking about. In fact, everybody here that goes to school, think, I want you to think about your school for a minute. If you don't go to school, maybe you're homeschooled, Think about when you go hang out with your friends. But if you go to school, think about your school, and specifically think about your lunchroom. I went to a high school with 3,000 students. We had a big lunchroom, and there were a lot of people in there. And, and every year, our lunch was split up into four, four different lunches. You can't fit 3,000 people in one room. You can, but not a lunchroom at a high school. So we had four different lunch periods, basically. And what happened was, we were able to pick and to sit wherever we wanted. I don't know, some people may have assigned lunches or assigned seating or whatever. I was able to pick every year where I wanted to sit. And so what I did was, I didn't sit with people I didn't know or people I didn't like. I sat with my best friends every single year. For four years, I sat with <coughs> almost the exact same people. There were people that transferred out and you know didn't have the same lunch as us, but almost every year, there were probably eight out of the ten people from the year before sitting at our table. And, and in fact, we sat in the same table all four years. There was this table at the far front of the lunchroom, right by the doors where you exit. I don't know why that was our seat. It's not like we were in a rush to get to class. We just, that was our table. And we, and we knew that. But what happened was, if other people tried to join and come to our table, even if we had extra seats, Often we, we would say, oh, sorry, that seat's taken, or you can't sit there. And we would say that seat's taken, but the whole 35 minutes we got for lunch, not a soul would sit there. And what happened was we had written people off, maybe just subconsciously. Maybe it was, we had talked about it. Uh, my, my, my best friends in high school, some of my best friends were a guy named Cody and a guy named Ryan. And for four years, we all sat at the same time. They were in my lunch every single semester for four years. We sat at the same table. We were, we were really great friends. And so we would, you know, if there was somebody one of us didn't like and they wanted to come sit at our table, we wouldn't let them because I knew Cody didn't want that person sitting there. Maybe it was because they didn't fit in. Maybe they didn't have the same likes as us. We all ran cross country. We ran track, played football. And if someone didn't kind of do those things, we kind of wrote them off. Not because they were uncool always, but they just didn't like the same stuff as us. Now, there were times that we thought they were uncool, and so we didn't want them a part, to be a part of our group. And so what that did is it made a name for us. You know, we kind of pick and chose who we wanted in our group, and we excluded other people. But maybe you've been the person that has been excluded. Just in there, we played musical chairs. Who enjoyed musical chairs? Several of us. <laughs> musical chairs is a fun game. It gets crazy sometimes, but if you were, if you miss musical chairs, or I heard Kenny say that some people didn't know how to play, if you completely miss the concept of musical chairs, what happens is you have a group. And let's say there's 10 people in that group. Well, what you have is nine chairs in a circle. And you play some music, 
and people walk around the circle, and when the music stops, everybody fights for a chair. Everybody tries to get that chair. Because if you don't get a chair, you're eliminated from the group. You're pushed out. You take a chair away, and then you do it all over again. Until there's one chair and two people left. But that's the same concept. It's pushing people out. Maybe you've been pushed out. Maybe like Cody and Ryan and myself, you were the person that pushed people out. Um, that's a, that's an, a, a thing that like you really miss an opportunity to get to know people when you do that. Um, I want to ask a question, and I want you to think about it for a second. Right here, tonight, I want you to look around at the people sitting next to you. These people are probably your friends. These are probably people you know fairly well. These are probably people you like. I'm pretty sure most people in this room are not sitting next to someone that they don't like. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So even right here at church, we see the exact same thing. The people you're sitting with are probably the same people you talked to in the lobby, the same people you were in a group with at game time, the same people that you'll talk to after the night is over. It's this group right here. Look across the room. Everybody, take, take a look somewhere across the room. It's somewhere different. And look at how many people you don't know. And, and I'm not talking about someone you, you might recognize. All right, everybody back up here. I'm not talking about someone you might recognize. I'm talking about someone you don't know. You don't, you don't know them. You might know who they are. You may have seen them around here or seen them at school. But you don't have a relationship with them. You don't know their last name. You don't know what activities they're into. You don't know what kind of movies they like. But the people probably sit next to you, you probably do know that. And so you've written people off, even if it's subconsciously. You don't, you don't every week go try and meet 13 new people. You hang out with the same 13 people that you've hung out with the last three years you've been coming to high school and middle school, Mosaic Student Ministries. That's the cycle, and that's what happens. And you're missing out on an opportunity to get to know people. And so I want to ask you guys a question, and I actually want you in your groups with your friends to talk about this question. And that question is, what are some places in your life that you see an insider-outsider mentality? In other words, what are some places in your life, your social life, that some people are welcome and some people are not? So I'll go ahead and spend some time talking about that, and I'll pull this all together here in a minute. Nobody wants to. Hi, I'm Lucy. All the volleyball girls said it one time, nobody else could say it there. One time, a bunch of kids sat at the varsity volleyball girls' table and they told them to move because that was their table. Yeah, like they all sat down and they came in there and they're like, excuse me, that's our table, you can't sit here and made it move. We have a bit, we have two tables. Everybody's in the I'm actually grown pretty, pretty good. I'm not first going to school to do this, like, with some people. I was about 15. Thank you. 
Get up and go check. It is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're all yeah. in now. <laughs> all right, everybody. Hi. I hope you guys had Hello. some time to talk about uh, some people that uh, are places that you may exclude people in your lives. Maybe you haven't noticed up to this point, uh, and so maybe that's an opportunity for you to realize that. But what I want you to do right now is take the Bible uh, that we passed out and open up to Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. What page is that on somebody? 545. 545 in the blue Bible. 545. If you brought your own Bible, can you repeat the verse, please? Verse 21. Chapter 5, verse 21. Mark. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to read this story, uh, and then we'll talk here in just a second. So, in verse 21, it says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side... A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea, uh, and then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him. He asked him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she uh, may be made well and live. And he went with him. Jesus went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, just touched his garment. Uh, for she said, if I touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately... The flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself, feeling in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you. You see all these people. What do you mean, who touched you? Um, and he looked around to see who had done it. Uh, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth, told him the whole story about her disease. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has been made well, has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, see, Jesus was following his guy to heal his daughter, and they stopped and did all this. And so now what happens is while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. Uh, but he put aside, he put them all outside and took the child's father and her mother and those who were with him, and he went into where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was tw of 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one would know this and told them to give her something to eat. See, uh, in this story here, basically what happens is this guy comes to Jesus and says, my daughter is dying. He's heard about Jesus and the miracles that he's performed, and he, he says, please come heal her. She's really, really sick. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you. And he goes with him, and you know they're, they're kind of walking down the street. It's probably a busy city, and all these people are around him, and some lady touches him, and he says, who touched me? And, uh, and this lady who had been sick, really sick for 12 years, she would spent all of her money on trying to be healed. And, if, and none of it helped. In fact, it, it made it worse. She got worse. Um, they stopped, and, and this whole thing went on, and, and this lady was healed. And then Jesus overheard a conversation 
The guy's servants came and said, you waited too long. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother Jesus any longer. But Jesus said, let's go. And so they get to the house, and as you would imagine, everybody's crying. Everybody's super <coughs> torn up about stuff. And, and what happened is Jesus said, stop crying. That girl's not dead. She's asleep. Now, that's kind of crazy for someone to say about a dead person. Oh, they're not dead. They're asleep. You would be like, no, you're foolish. She's dead. Um, but, but Jesus took her mother and father and his disciples, his three disciples that were with him, and he went inside, and he touched the girl's hand and said, wake up, basically. Basically said, wake up. You're, you're fine. And she woke up, and she got up out of bed, and she was walking around, and she was fine. And so the big picture, what happened that day was two women were healed. A lonely woman with no money and a very, very, very cherished and wealthy little girl. See, that old lady spent every dime she had, so she was poor. The little girl's dad was a ruler. He had tons of money. They were both healed. Um, and Jesus took a... I mean, he, he did a miracle that day. But what, he, what the bigger miracle is that he didn't discriminate. He didn't, he didn't choose just these people that he knew or just these people that were well-known. He chose the lady that, that nobody cared about. But he also chose the lady, the little girl, who everybody knew her father and they were well-known. See, Jesus didn't pick and choose. He didn't have in his mind, he didn't write people off and say, Oh, you're worthy, but you're not. Jesus was open and welcoming everybody. And so, I have another question for you guys. Uh, and, and I want you to think about this, and I want you to talk about it in your groups. And that question is, is there any group of people that you have judged or deemed as outside in your thoughts and in your heart? And who are they? So, is there anybody that, that you write off and you, you say is outside of your group? Who are those people? Go ahead and talk about that for a second. Probably cut out what's going on right here. Because I remember myself in the front of some of the guests in the podcast. So they would cut out what's here. Just all of them. Just all I'm not exactly. 
have the same messed up teeth. Like his teeth do the exact same thing in the exact same places. We have the same teeth. Like every single tooth that's messed up in my mouth is messed up in my mouth. We have the same freckles. We have the same eyebrows. We have the same face structure. It's ridiculous. I'm like the exact replica. No denying he's my dad. Uh, so now you talk about you talk about where uh, you might have this mindset. Now you talk about specific people that you might have this mindset about. Uh, but now I want to tell you a story about my personal life and, and where all this plays in. <coughs> so I was in the seventh grade. And I, my family had just moved to a brand new house. A new neighborhood, new house, tons of new people, new school district. Um, and behind us, one house, and to the left, if you look off my back porch. So if you're looking off my back porch, behind me and to the left uh, was one of my mom's friends. And she had a son who was uh, a year, less than a year younger than me. Uh, he was in the grade below me. And I kind of heard about him and known. I, I knew who he was from church and stuff. And uh, I in no way whatsoever wanted any part of him in my life. He was a weird kid. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, he went to a magnet school. And for those of you that don't know what a magnet school is, uh, it's for really smart people. You have to take a test and have like super awesome rocket scientist grades and take like. When he was in sixth grade, he was taking eighth and ninth grade classes, and I was taking like. When I was in seventh grade, I was taking like eighth grade classes, so I was a little bit advanced, but not several years advanced. And so, and the kids at this school, it's called Merrill Hyde, they were into like weird stuff. They had like a robotics club, and like, Ooh, he did that instead of play football. And so like, it was just weird to me. Uh, and so my mom kept saying, I want you to go meet Hayden, I want you to go meet Hayden, because my mom and, and Hayden's mom, Ms. Barbara, they were really great friends. Uh, and I was like, Mom, listen, I'm a cool kid. I'm at least fairly cool. Like, I may not be the coolest kid in school, but I'm a lot cooler than that. And if I start hanging out with him, game over. I'm going to have no friends, ever. Uh, because I didn't go to the magnet school. If I went to the magnet school, I'm sure I would have had plenty of friends. But I didn't. I went to public school. Uh, and I was on the football team, and I was an athlete, and I wasn't going to hang out with a nerd. And so, finally... Uh, I agreed-ish because there were consequences if I didn't agree. So it was one of those, like, if you don't do it, this is going to happen. I'm sure they like, threatened to ground me or something. Or Anyway, I kind of agreed only because I didn't want to get in trouble to go meet this kid, Hayden. And so I go over, uh, it was like a Saturday, and I go over early in the morning. It was like 10, early, but we all know what that means when you're in high school. Uh, so it was like 10 in the morning. And uh, I went over, and I, I knocked on the door. My mom was with me, and uh, and this lady answered the door. And that lady was Hayden's mom, and her name is Mrs. Barbara. She's one of those ladies who's, like, super nice but really touchy. Like, oh, hey, come on in, give me a... And I'm, like, not a touchy person. So that was kind of weird, but she's a super nice lady. Um, and so she's like, let's go meet Hayden. And so my mom, like, sent me off, and I was like... As the door was shutting, like, no, stop, don't make me do this. Uh, but she made me do it. And so uh, I followed Hayden's mom, and she's like, oh, Hayden's down in the basement. <laughs> okay, I used to have a basement in my old house. We hung out down there. That's fine. Uh, so we go down the stairs, and I look around, and there's nobody in the basement. There's nobody there. And Ms. Barbara says, Hayden? And over in the corner, this kid pokes his head out of these bed sheets that are over this table, He's got glasses and like a goofy haircut. And he's like, yes, mom. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. 
only an hour or two of this, and I'm good as gold. I'm out of here. And uh, and Hayden's mom says, Hayden, come meet Justin. He's going to be your new friend. And I wanted to correct her and be like, I'm going to hang out with you for a couple hours so I don't get in trouble, but then I'm out of here, and it's game over. Uh, and so Hayden says, oh, come on in. He had, like, built a fort. Like, when you're, when you're like, five and six, you build forts. Well, Hayden was in sixth grade building forts, and I saw all these, like, wires running out of the fort, and I was like, well, he's a genius. He probably, like, built a house under there or something. So... He says, come on in. Very welcoming and inviting, but I don't want any part of it, because I've written them off in my mind. And so, uh, so I go in, and for hours, I mean, I never looked at the time, not one time, we played James Bond, one of the James Bond video games on the GameCube, for hours. And finally, Hayden's mom calls down the basement stairs and says, are you guys hungry? It's dinner time. And uh, we're like, yeah, of course. She's like, all right, come on up. And so Hayden and I went on up, and his mom made spaghetti and meatballs. I, I don't know why I remember everything that happened, but I do. His mom made spaghetti and meatballs, and it was delicious. And afterwards, we rented a movie. I don't know what movie it was. I think it was a superhero movie. Probably one of the horrible Spider-Mans with Tobey Maguire. Something like that. Uh, and so we, we watched a movie, had popcorn, played some more video games, and I ended up spending the night at this kid's house. Uh, but the, the reason I tell you that story is because I had written this kid off, and still to this day, Hayden is my best friend in the whole world. There, there is literally no greater person, more important person to me than Hayden. Uh, you know, we live in different states and stuff, but we call each other at least once a week. I flew, I flew him out uh, to visit me last summer. He, his family ended up moving away to Arizona, and I flew him out, and he, he stayed with me for a week. At Christmas this year, I'm going out and I'm staying with him. And so, like, he is my greatest friend in the whole world. And he always will be. When I'm an old man and I'm going on fishing trips and stuff, the guy that I'm going to call to go with me is Hayden. But what happened was, I would have completely missed out on that if I would kept that mentality of just writing him off because I didn't know him and he was different than me. I, I knew nothing about him. I didn't want any part of him in my life. And that day was literally the best day of my life because I, I made my absolute best friend in the whole world. And we did weird stuff that I didn't tell my friends about when I went back to school. <laughs> I didn't tell them about the fort and video games and all that. I mean, eventually it's inevitable for them to collide, but my friends loved him eventually in four more years when they met. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But what the deal is, guys, is, is I, I was missing out. I mean, I lived in that house for three or four months before I ever forcefully agreed to go meet this kid. I missed out. I could have spent that four months hanging out with the, my best friend in the whole world. And I missed it. So the next question I want to ask you guys, and I want you to talk about is, have you ever written somebody off? Have you ever judged somebody and not wanting to be a part of your group? And when you finally met them, they don't, have to be, they don't have to have become your best friend. I think that's a weird freak situation. I just got lucky. But have you ever maybe found out you liked those people? Maybe there was a kid that you got partnered with in class. Maybe you had a class <coughs> project and, and you had to. And you get to being around them and, and you realize they aren't so bad. Maybe you occasionally hang out from time to time. I want you to talk about your groups if that's ever happened to you. Tell a story. Spend some time talking about it. Go ahead and do that. Yep. Tell the campus friends. We had a school retreat, and I thought it was really weird. And he came up, and he talked to me, and he hung out with me like the whole time. And I was thinking, oh, this is awkward. This kid's really weird. But like, now we're really, really close. I am weird. So. I'm still thinking Thank you. 
stab you in the back. stories later I'd love to hear them um, but guys what I what I hope that you see in telling your stories like that is maybe eventually you open up to somebody that uh, you were originally closed off to and your perspective changes you find out that, that hey these people are people too and they're pretty cool um, because the thing about it is, is is God's kingdom you know we talked last week about the trade that Jesus offers us that trade is not just open to your group of friends it's not just open to the cool kids at school. It's not just open to the athletes or the National Honor Society members or the debate club. God's, God's kingdom and that trade is open to everyone. The athletes, the artists, Matt Baker, stop please. The musicians, <laughs> the musicians, the brainiacs, the dumb kids. The kids that are college grads, the kids that are high school dropouts, and it's it's open to you too. See, see, God, we saw in that that short story in Mark that Jesus doesn't discriminate. the The opportunity is open to anybody and everybody. And we talked about that trade last week, and and that's available to all of us. Um, but when we judge people, we make them we make them an object. We dehumanize them, and, and in doing that, we lose sight of the one task that Jesus gave us, and that's to love people, to love everybody, share his love with everyone. When we judge people, we exclude them, and shutting the door shuts off any opportunity to do that, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus called us to do. In Matthew 28, uh, we find the Great Commission, and basically the dumb version of that is, Go and, and share my name with the world and make disciples of everyone. Now, you won't find that terminology in your Bible unless you get, like, the message or something. But, but that, that's essentially what it's saying. Go and share my love with everyone. But if you're closed, closed-minded to people and you're writing people off and you're not giving an opportunity for people to 
enter into your life, they don't want to hear what you have to say. And so what we have to do is we have to swap our mindset. We have to exchange and trade the mindset that we have now where we're closed off to certain people. Maybe, maybe you, you don't even like certain people. But the thing is, is Jesus offers that opportunity to those people too. Just because you don't like somebody doesn't mean that Jesus is like, oh, Justin doesn't like him, so I'm going to have to revoke that opportunity. He, he doesn't have the opportunity at, at, at my love. I'm not going to share my love with him. Jesus loves everyone. And so we have to swap our mindsets, guys. Take the mindset that you have now that's closed off and unwilling to be open and, and share our lives with other people and swap that for a life that is open to sharing the gospel with new people and just showing love to people and caring about people and letting them into your lives because Jesus led us into his. See, last week we gave everybody uh, the paper clip and you, you've been trading and, and I hope that as, as you've been doing that, you've been thinking about that swap that we talked about. And this week as you, as you go and make that swap, you have an opportunity to think about something else. Think about the swap that happens in your mind, the renewed mind, mindset of loving everybody, accepting everybody. And, and that's the swap that we're called to. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight, God. Thank you for the, the trade that you made, the exchange that you made uh, with our lives, God. The life of <coughs> sin and brokenness, for a life of purity and renew and a renewed, a renewed life and an eternal life with you, God. Thank you for that opportunity. God, I pray that as we go in our schools, as we go to our sports teams and our clubs and our bands and everything that we're involved in, God, that we, we won't have a mindset that, that writes people off, that pushes people out of the group. So that, that, God, you'll, you'll swap our mindset, God, for, a, for an open mind. A mind that is only open to loving everyone, God. A mindset that, that our, our biggest desire is to share your love with everyone, God. Because we know that that's what you've called us to do. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight and have a blast and play fun games and all those things. And I pray that as, as we go into this week, you'll help us to remember those things. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.
The bigger it is, the better it is. My son Richard set out with a dime a while back. He went to the first store and said, hey, we're playing bigger better. I've got a dime and I'm hoping to trade it for something bigger. Do you have anything you can trade me? The guy at the door had never heard of this game. Nevertheless, he immediately went in and he shouted over his shoulder to his wife. Hey Marge, there's this kid here and we are playing bigger or better. I love that he said we. We do have, what do you, what do we have that's bigger and better than a dime? Richard walked away with a mattress. <laughs> he went from a dime to a mattress. Uh, says, Rich went with his buddies to the next door and they knocked while Rich stood on the porch with his mattress. The door opened and his muffled voice could barely be heard as he shouted through this uh, Serta pillow top asking if his next neighbor would trade him with would trade with him for something bigger and better than a mattress. A little while later, he skipped away from the house having traded the mattress for a ping pong table. <laughs> okay, it keeps going. Richard wheeled the ping pong table to the next house and traded up for an elk head. How cool is that? I want to stop there, but Rich didn't. He kept trading up. By the end of the night, when Rich came home, he didn't have a dime or a mattress or a ping pong table or an elk head or the five other things he traded up. Richard drove home in a pickup truck. No oh. lie. He started with a dime and ended up with a Dodge. <laughs> yeah, you guys all wish. See? This is motivation, right? Okay. Listen. Go to your neighbors. That's the key. Go to your neighbors. Okay, keep listening. It gets better. I remember, I remember reading this quote from C.S. Lewis where he says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That quote reminds me of a passage in the Bible about a young guy who had a lot of money. He was a good guy, very religious, kept the commandments and the whole bit. Jesus told this upstanding guy that if he really wanted to know God, he needed to sell all his possessions and follow him. The man was sad about the exchange. Like me, he liked his stuff, but he liked Jesus too. Ultimately, though, that young man decided he would, he'd work too hard for what he had. Whatever he had to trade to get Jesus was just too important, and what Jesus had to offer was just too intangible. So he chose to keep his stuff rather than follow Jesus. Jesus doesn't have this conversation to shame the rich young ruler. The challenge that comes into sharp relief is whether we are willing to give up all we have to follow him, to know him. Are we willing to trade up? It's a question worth asking because the answer will shape your life one way or the other. We've all given up something at one time or another. At first, it feels like a huge sacrifice to, get up, to give up what we've got. To Jesus though, Jesus, though, it's no sacrifice at all. Think about it from his perspective. He comes from heaven, where he has an amazing love relationship with the Father, which, by its nature, is the most beautiful existence any person could have. And he offers that to anybody willing to let go of whatever is giving them a false sense of security. Why would anybody not make that trade? Jesus is basically saying, look, none of the stuff you have is going to last, including you. You've only got about a dime's worth of life now. Come on and trade up. Come follow me, and you can know God. In that sense, Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't requesting a sacrifice at all. He's asking us to play bigger and better, where we give up ourselves and end up with him. It's important to note here that Jesus didn't ask everybody to give, to give up all their stuff. This is something he asked of the rich young ruler, because he wanted to teach the young man that he wasn't as holy as he thought he was. He wanted to teach the young man that he still needed God's help. To look at what he had and decide whether he would have, and to decide whether he would rather have that or trade up and have what Jesus is offering, a life with him. Actually, the real game of bigger and better that Jesus is playing with us usually isn't about money or possessions or even hope. It's about our pride. He asks if we're willing to give up that thing we're so proud of, that thing that we believe causes us to matter in the eyes of the world, and to 
give it up to follow him. He's asking us, will you take what you think defines you, leave it behind, and let me define who you are instead? The cool thing about taking Jesus up on his offer is that whatever controls you doesn't anymore. People who used to be obsessed about becoming famous no longer care whether anybody knows their name. People who used to want power are willing to serve. People who used to chase money freely give it all away. People who used to beg others for acceptance are now strong enough to give love. When we get our security from Christ, we no longer have to look for it in the world, and that's a pretty good trade. Do you know what Rich did with that truck? He gave it away. He drove it to the church down the street and tossed in the keys. He didn't even need it and didn't want it, and what he got in exchange for it was bigger and better still. He got a sense of satisfaction, confidence, and reaffirmation that stuff didn't have control over him. While it was a good story to have traded up and gotten a truck, it was an even better story, a more whimsical one, to have given it away in the end. And he got to serve God, not by sacrificing, but by trading up in the way he lived his life. Although he started with just a dime, he walked away with a great example of how Jesus sees us in this world. Religious people say that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. I agree, but there's more. Jesus invites us to stand at the door of his house and do some knocking too. And when he opens the door, he wants us to bring all of the faith we have to him, even if it's just a dime's worth. And he promises that he will trade up with us because he himself is what we have the chance to trade for. And what we'll have to give in exchange for knowing him is everything we've accumulated during our lives and are standing on the porch holding on to. So, just a good story. It really, was really encouraging to me. I don't know if that was encouraging to you guys, but this is just a game. What's bigger, what's better, what we're willing to exchange to swap to switch is Jesus. So just as you're going through your week and as you're taking that paper clip, have this story, have what we just heard, have what we talked about last week with Joel, have that in your mindset. What are you willing to trade and give up for Jesus? So we're going to go into announcements, but real quick, does anyone have any other trades they want to share? Any other, I mean, and I know a truck is hard to achieve, but any other <laughs> things you guys have been trading? I traded it for a red pen. A red pen, that is good. It's one step up. Keep going. You guys, you guys have one more week, okay? And there's another ministry that did this. The, the point is you have to bring what your final trade is next week so we can figure out who's biggest and best. Um, the other ministry that did this, the kid that won, he came in with a hot tub. So um, it is possible. Go to your neighbors. Talk to them. It's fun. Do it with your friends. Go around. You don't need to sell stuff door to door. Go do that, but do it with this paper clip. And uh, next week, listen, next week we're announcing our winners. You have to bring the item, though, so we'll figure out who's uh, bigger and better. So pictures, too, but, I mean, you, you're going to want to bring it. We, we want to see it. You could, you could Photoshop stuff. I don't know. I need to see it next week, okay? So give it up for Justin one more time. He's going to go through your mouth. Right. 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 Right.